Today, we, our main text is going to come from the book of Matthew. So if you turn to Matthew chapter 6, I'll read from verse 19 to verse 24. Matthew chapter 6, from verse 19 to 24. The Bible says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is a lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve, verse 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So our topic today, as you've heard, is financial, hand, financial management, financial, financial handling. And it is one of those topics that uh, it's rarely spoken about or People normally do not speak very often about it, especially from a biblical point of view. And to be honest, even me, when I was, when I was given the topic, I, what, initially had in, uh, what, I, what I had initially thought about is not what I'm going to be preaching about today. But all through the summer preparation, I've had a chance to really learn a lot from this portion of the text and many others that I will read. And I hope that we will also get to learn. It could also be true that uh, we rarely hear, as I've said, we rarely hear Bible-centered sermons on, on money and in fact at times, or more often than not, this is a topic that is usually considered less spiritual. So when one is given an opportunity to speak or to share with some friends, we, we, there's always that feeling of running to the world and getting to hear, or getting to pick some teachings from the world that could be good teachings and not bad teachings. But friends, um, I'd like to argue that uh, the Bible speaks so much about this topic. Take for instance the four books of the, the gospel books of the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In Matthew, Christ speaks about this topic 109 times. In the book of Mark, he speaks about it 57 times. In the book of Luke, he talks about it 94 times. And in the book of John, he talks about it 88 times. Basically, the Lord spoke about five times more on this topic than any other topic or subject that you preached about. And there's one man David Holly who says, money is an important biblical topic as one verse in every six in the first three gospels relates either directly or indirectly to money. Sixteen of our Lord's 42 parables deal with the use or the misuse of money. And so as we come to this topic, um, I plead with us to pay keen and close attention and just hear what God has to say through his word. Um, my outline will, well, there are two, I have two little points, let me say so, or two, my outlines are in two points. One will explore the two commandments or the two choices that you have seen in Matthew 6, especially verse 19 to 21. And then we're going to see the implications of uh, the command or these commandments or, or this choice. And maybe before we can start us off, uh, just as a way of introduction, this portion of text comes in, in, when Christ was speaking when Christ was speaking on the Mount of what we normally refer to as the Sermon on the Mount. And Christ is coming from speaking and, and, and showing us what is the right view of ourselves, what is the right view of the world through this Sermon on the Mount. Christ also exposes what is the right view of the Word of God. He speaks about the right view of moral issues, the right view of religious issues, and now he's speaking to us, or he speaks now uh, regarding to the right view of money and wealth and, and necessities, if you so please. And all this is set in contrast to, in contrast to the religious system that the scribes and the Pharisees, the Pharisees have put into place. So, in our text today, Christ proceeds to say these words. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. This is verse 19. So then, what does Christ mean when he says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth? So I'll just try to break down the words as, as you work towards what the, 
the, the portion of text actually means. And I'll begin with that word, lay up. So the word is basically translated as store up, or treasure up, or hope. And in the original statement, it was, it was, it was, like a, it was a play of words. So it would read something like, do not stock piles of stock, or do not treasure up treasures. So basically, it's more or less the same word. It's the root word of treasure that is actually translated lay up. And so in simple terms, the commandment is telling us that we should not stash uh, something someplace, or we should not hold something in, in, in some place. And so we we'll read the statement as do not store up, do not hold, do not stash your treasures on earth. Moving on, what the Bible also speaks of storing up treasures. So what does this word treasure mean in this verse that we are referring to? And Personally, I believe that it refers to actual wealth and possessions. You can read Mark chapter 10, verse 21, and also Luke 12, 33. But even more on, just when you look at the context, at the context or the, success, the successive verses, the Bible speaks of moths and rusts and thieves. And a Jew listener then, if somebody was a Jew, or the Jews then during Christ's time, if they were listening to Christ speak, they would understand what Christ was saying. And this is because in the olden times, wealth was stored up in three major ways. The first way was garments, through garments. Wealth was also stored through grain. Wealth was also stored through gold or precious metal. And if you can recall in 2 Kings chapter 5, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, wished to make some forbidden prophet through Naaman's through curing of Naaman's leprosy. And so the Bible says he asked for a talent of silver and two changes of garments because that was a substantial, that was substantial wealth for them. You will also remember in Genesis 45 when Joseph was bestowing affection to Benjamin, he gave him five changes of garments. And also in Judges 14, Samson asks this question, if, if one can answer this riddle, I promise you 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. So garments were always an expression of wealth because they were a commodity of great value. Another way that wealth was stored up, as we have seen, is through grains. And you will remember the rich fool, and we'll get back to this as we'll come and come back to this as I preach through uh, this portion of text. But in the parable of the rich fool in Luke 12, we see the rich fool saying that I will tear down my barns and I will build bigger barns so that I might hold more. And so his wealth was in his in his grave. And you know what the risk was in storing wealth uh, in, in these two forms? Well, the Bible tells us, do not lay up treasures for yourselves on earth, where moth and rust will destroy. So, these forms of storing of wealth through garments and grain, they face a risk of being destroyed by moths and being destroyed by rust. The other commodity that people use to store their wealth in is, or was, in form of gold or precious metal. And you know what the problem was with that? Well, Again, the verse tells us that these would come in, break in, and steal whatever you have. Uh, well, in this case, whatever you have. He, in, in, in the ground, so normally what people would do is they would, in, the, in the middle of the night, they would uh, pick their gold, go into the field, and look for a place that they would want to bury that gold. And then they would bury their gold, but then thieves would come and find, probably look at the place that has been. It looks like somebody has dug here and they would dig, and then they would be able to get the treasures that uh, that person had stored up. I mean, if you read Matthew, Matthew 13, we read of the parable of the hidden treasure, which was also which was stored in the field. And so Christ is commanding us not to store up our wealth on this earth. He commands us not to hold up material wealth uh, on earth, because ultimately the substance of our wealth is going to come to an end. We have seen that it faces a risk of Thieves, it faces a risk of rust, it faces a risk of moth. So our wealth on earth is bound to come to an end, either through earthly causes or you know through uh, some decisions, or definitely when we die a few years later, we know very well of how those stories go. How the wealth of many in this world normally gets depleted. 
But then what does Christ do through this commandment? We have seen that Christ is telling us not to lay up for ourselves or not to store or hold for ourselves wealth, actual wealth, money or possessions. So what does he mean? Does he mean then that you are not to have any wealth or possession in this world? Or that it is back to any material wealth? Well, I don't think so. And the reason is, if you, if you go to Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, on the first part, the Bible says that you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth. So God has given us the power to get wealth. We cannot claim that we generate wealth by our own being or by our own strength. We see clearly that God is the one who gives us strength. And if acquiring wealth was a bad thing in and of itself, then the Lord would not have given us the energy to do so. And so it can be argued that we attain the wealth that we have because of God. In 1 Corinthians 4 7, Paul also gives a very profound statement in form of a question. And he asks, And what do you have that you did not receive? The Bible therefore clearly articulates that everything that we have, we acquire, including material wealth, all of this is given to us by God. We cannot claim that the wealth or the possessions that we have is ours, or that it is by our own effort that we get this wealth. We clearly see that God is the one who enables us to acquire wealth and is the one who gives us everything that we need. We can therefore imply that because everything we receive is from God, therefore God is the owner. We are not the owners of whatever we have. So God technically owns everything and He just gives it to us. You can read Job 41 verse 11 and 1 Timothy 4, 3 to 5. And basically what this text of scripture will tell us or will tell you when you read is that God is the ultimate owner of everything in this world. And so since we have been given these things by God, since we have been given material wealth, uh, possessions by God, the Lord therefore commands us that we be good stewards. And normally when the word stewardship is used in the Bible, it's used to refer to a manager of a household. So it's basically you are given something to manage on behalf of someone else. So we are called to be, to be faithful stewards, to faithfully manage the resources, the wealth, the possessions included, the gifts that God has given us. And, and of course this is, this, this is driven by what you've just read, that there is nothing that we actually have that is ours. It all belongs to God, and therefore God commands us that we be faithful stewards. And so a question to ask this evening is, are we faithful in what God has given us? Um, including material wealth and possessions if they come our way. And it will just allow me to read some supporting verses on especially this fact that the Lord requires us to be faithful in what He has given to us because we are just but managers of what we receive from Him. I'll read 1 Corinthians 4 and 2. You don't have to open there, but just let me read. Um, the Bible says, this is how Paul's speaking to the Corinthians. This is how I should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. The Bible tells us that we are called to be faithful in the very things that God has graciously given to us. Another portion of text is 1 Peter 4 The Bible says that as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. We'll speak more about this uh, as we go along. But the Bible says, use the gifts that God has given you to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. So it's clear from scripture that the Lord commands us to be faithful in stewarding whatever he has given us. So back to Matthew chapter 6. As we seek to understand what Christ meant, we have seen that he never meant that we should not have or acquire wealth and possessions. Instead, he commands us to faithfully manage what he has given us. So then he mean that we should not work for or work with an intention of getting paid or earning a means of living? I don't think so. Because we are instructed also in the Bible that we need to earn a living so that we can provide for those who are in need and also for our families. And this especially is very clear when we read Ephesians chapter 4 verse 28. I think you can turn there because I might spend a little bit of time on that verse. I think it has a lot to has things that we can learn from, especially in relation to the topic that we have today. So Ephesians chapter 4 verse 28, the Bible says, Let the thief no longer steal, 
but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own, with, with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. So the believer is being exhorted to put his hands in some form of business or work, honest work for that matter, rather than stealing, and then through that they get something to share with anyone in need. So we, we, we know very well in Genesis 2.15 that God made man for toil, and therefore employment or entrepreneurship is essential in this life. I, I like to think of it as a basic unit of toiling in the world of today. So Paul says that the thief should no longer steal but labor doing honest work with his own hands. So what, what can we get from this? Number one, we are called to have some business or profession by which we get a means to support other people. So the Bible doesn't tell us that we get, we get some entrepreneurship, uh, some employment gigs or business gigs so that we can sort ourselves out, but the Bible tells us that we get this so that we might have something to share with anyone in need. So really we see the Bible really speaking about, you know, get this money or get this wealth so that you can live a certain kind of life or so that you can please yourself or, you know, normally how the world use money. But you can see from this scripture that God, God commands us to have or to be in some form of business that through which you get some money or a means to support other people who are in need. Secondly, we can see from that text that our faith calls us into, well, some versions call it industriousness, other versions call it labors. So we are called into industriousness. And, and as I go through these points, I'd like us to just reflect on, or think of this as guiding principles on how we can acquire finances. I believe that the Bible has some principles to guide us on that. So, as we've seen, our faith calls us into labors, or as some version says, industriousness. And one commentator said, while commenting on this verse, that it is rare that an idle man becomes a Christian, but if he does, our faith makes him industrious, just in proportion as it has influence over his mind. And did you actually know that the Bible speaks or comes so hard uh, towards Christians who are supposedly lazy? Turn with me to 2 Thessalonians 3.16 as you put your finger on Ephesians 4.28. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Just to see how, uh, what the Lord says about Christians who are, in quotes, lazy. 2 Thessalonians 6, 3 verse 6. The Bible says, Now we command you, brothers, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. Yeah, the Bible says that we are to keep off, we are to avoid those brothers. And the language here is, 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 is the language like that of excommunicating one from your fellowship. So the Bible is really serious about this fact. Paul continues to exhort the saints towards industrious, industriousness, uh, still in the same verse, in, in the same portion of text. Verse 7, the Bible says, For yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we are not idle when we are with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor, we want night and day that you might not be a burden of a, to any of you. It was not because we, we do not have a right, but to give you in ourselves an example to it. So we have even an example in the Bible to it uh, on this matter of industriousness and hard work and laboring. So back to Ephesians 4.28, we have seen that the Bible says we have to be in some form of business or employment so that we can get some money or some means to support those who are here. We have also seen that the Bible calls us to industriousness. Another, the third point uh, on this portion of text is Scripture or this verse uh, calls us into not just any, any form of business or employment. You'll notice the word stealing, you'll notice the word honest. So, Scripture calls us into some useful and honest employment or business as opposed to stealing. And stealing here could be understood largely as defrauding people either by the detailing what is due to them or, uh, or by actually taking away things or taking away the or taking away items from people. John Gill puts it this way, referring to stealing, that it is a fraudulent taking away of another man's goods without the knowledge and will of the owner for 
the sake of gain, or not making good, or not performing payments, or unjust con contracts, detention of wages, unfaithfulness in anything committed to trust, advising, encouraging, and receiving from these. So we are called to refrain from stealing. And then we are exhorted towards labor such should, some versions will say, work that which is good. And basically the Bible is calling us not to pursue employment that will necessarily injure or harm people, or employment or business opportunity that will lead people towards, expose them to sin and lead them uh, ultimately to eternal ruin. An honest employment will benefit people rather than destroy people's lives. So we are to look for opportunities, especially us who are in the university and we explore the outside world. We have to look for opportunities for labor that will lead to the betterment of people's lives and not lead to thousands of people perishing or being injured in some way or form. So our question to us is, is this usually our view? Or is this what guides our process when we are making applications, going for internships, and all those things, or when we are considering business opportunities? Or, is this, or, or do we only consider the packages and the remunerations, expectations that we hope to achieve through the same opportunities? Uh, and for those of us who are earning, can we say that we are earning a living from people's misery? Or are we, are we actually earning or getting opportunities that will allow us to work that which is good? And lastly, the fourth point which you have also spoken about in Ephesians 4, the Bible tells us that we are to use our businesses or employment opportunities to, 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 as a means to get something so that we might be able to help those who are in need. So rarely, as I've said, will you find people commending you to yourself. So always helping people, help the saints, support your family, and we support them through a means of living. So going back to Matthew 6, 19-23, as we still try to answer the meaning of what Christ was saying, we have seen that he never really meant that we are not to work for or work with the intention of getting pay or acquire means of living. Christ also never meant that we are not to have or acquire anywhere in this world. So then, did he mean that we are not to plan for our finances? Or did he mean that we should not put our money in some form of savings, especially in or earthly investments? Well, I don't think so. And, and this is because if you read Proverbs 6, uh, 6 to 11, you can just note it down, you don't have to turn there. Um, God says uh, in verse 6, go to the ant, O sluggard. Consider how well is the bee wise. Without having any chief officer or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. So God encourages us to be wise like this servant, like this ant, sorry. The ants prepare bread in summer and gather, basically they store, uh, uh, they store bread in summer so that when winter comes or when times come when they do not have, they are not able to gather up so much, they are able to use uh, what they have gathered from, what they have gathered and stored in their results. You could also read Luke chapter 14, 28 to 30, and Proverbs 21 to 20, 20, Proverbs chapter 21, verse 20. And you'll see more of this being, well, it's, it's either implied or directly, uh, you know, said by, the, by, by God's word that we should be wise to save up, we should be wise to plan for our finances. Because you never know when an emergency actually hits your, your, your life. And, and I think at times God gives us those moments of pleasure so that we are wise to budget, we are wise to save up, so that when hard times come, um, we are able to use what we have stored up for such purposes. So the Bible does encourage us towards, uh, towards being wise and saving. And so we go back to, to that same thing command that Christ was saying, do not lay up for yourselves treasures of life. You see that it doesn't mean that you are not to have it well, it doesn't mean that you are not to uh, pursue some form of employment through which you get a means to serve or help other people. We have also seen that it doesn't mean that you should not plan on finances or save some money. So then, what does it say? Is, it, is Christ saying that we should, that it is bad for us to enjoy the money that we earn or purchase stuff for our enjoyment? Well, I also do not think so, because if you read Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22 to 27, and especially in verse 26, um, God, God, God says that uh, 
and, and this I think he was speaking to the Israelites, he says, or he instructs the Israelites to spend money on whatever they desire, on whatever they desire before him and rejoice in the Lord. And also if you read first Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, we 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 also see the Bible telling us that the Lord provides us with uh, everything for our own enjoyment. He he richly re rewards us or gives us things for our own uh, enjoyment. Therefore, Christ would it be meaning that you're not to enjoy the wages or the money that you get from our labors, but that we should do that, having in mind that everything we do should be done for the glory of God. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. So, we have seen that Christ did not mean that we should not have wealth. Uh, he also did not mean that we should not have some form of you know, employment or business, or that we should not. He also did not mean that we should not, um, uh, that we should not plan for our finances. So then, what did he actually mean in this portion of text that you have just read? And I'll read it again. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. So Christ introduces an aspect of the where in these verses, or the place. There's a place that is being mentioned. There's earth, and then there's heaven. And I think he does this to introduce the main idea of where he is driving to, or it, 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 it sort of acts as a precursor of the main point that Christ wants to drive home. So Christ says that we are not to store up our treasures on earth, but rather we are to store them in heaven. And the question is why? And verse 21 gives us the reason to that. Because wherever your treasure is, there your heart is also. And I believe that Christ is mostly speaking to us about the attitude and the posture of our hearts towards what we have. And, and the reason why the where, uh, the where of where we store our treasures is very important is because wherever that place is, our hearts are there also. And so I, I believe that Christ is referring, or his main point is, is driving his listeners to, to the heart, towards the heart, and towards uh, the right view of, 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 of the right view of wealth, to, uh, the right view of wealth by our hearts. So financial management needs to begin from an understand from an understanding or a right diagnosis of our hearts. And there's a very good illustration that the Bible gives us for this story up uh, well. Uh, this is in Luke 12, 13 to 21. This is the parable of the rich fool. Um, I won't read the whole portion of scripture, but I can just explain. Basically, it's the story of this rich, rich man, I believe he was a farmer, who had gathered a lot of uh, produce, or he was able to get uh, produce for his goods, sorry, produce from his harvest. And then the Bible says that perhaps because of his covetousness, perhaps because he believed in the lie that his life revolved around the abundance of his wealth, the Bible says that he thought to himself to tear down his barns and build larger ones so that he can store his grains and goods or so that he can store up his wealth. And ultimately his desire, the Bible says, tells us this, was to pat himself on the back because he had stopped piling enough to secure his future. And the Bible says in verse 20 uh, that God said to this, to this man, God said, Fool, that night your soul, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? And this is the story of a fool who tragically lost his soul. Basically, he was a damned fool. And before I, 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 I continue with that portion of text, just uh, something small about money and, and, and why it's important that, uh, or why Christ says these commandments. Uh, one thing that we have to realize about the relationship between money and the world is that money is significant because we, we exchange it for whatever we value. So take for instance, if you value food, sorry, if you value taste, uh, you will spend money on food if you value entertainment. You are going to, to spend money on Netflix or theaters. If you value uh, education, you are going to spend uh, your money on you know, books. If you value God's work, you are going to spend money in God's ministries or in the gospel. And as one preacher of the West says, 
the movement of money or your money signifies the movement of your heart. So where your money goes, your heart is also going there. So you basically exchange money for what you value and what you treasure. And how vulnerable our hearts are. And especially, I mean, for all of us, myself included, our hearts are so vulnerable and, and, and our hearts bind to those lives that if I have money, I have everything. I'll be okay if, you know, my life revolves around the abundance, the abundance of what I have. But then Christ passionately and urgent, urgently tells us in Luke 12, 15, that, that portion of text about the rich fool, that our life does not consist in having lots of things. Our life does not revolve around the abundance of the things that we have. Instead, John 17, tells us that our life is about knowing God. Our life is not about the things that we have. It is a life of knowing God. And so in verse 21 of, of Luke chapter 12, um, the Bible says that this rich fool, what he did, he did that as one who laid up treasures, treasures for himself and, and, and was not rich toward God. And, and we see that word coming up again, laying up treasures for ourselves. So what does it actually mean? And, 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 and I, I believe that one of the ways to understand this is to just look at the contrast of what it means, of what uh, being, rich, being rich in God means to understand uh, the, what uh, labor treasures mean, or look at the opposite of labor treasures for ourselves so that you can understand what it means by being rich towards God. And so picking the contrast or the opposite of laying up treasures for ourselves we can deduce that being rich in God is the opposite of acting as if life consists, as we have seen, acting as if life consists in the ab abundance of possessions, not in the abundance of knowing God. Therefore, being rich towards God would mean being drawn toward God as the ultimate treasure, as the most valuable thing in our lives. And a heart that does this will not lay up for itself treasures on earth. It would also mean to use our money in such a way that we make God, uh, we, we show how valuable God is to our lives. And so a question to us today is, are we rich towards God? Do we love God money? Do we love God more than we love money or the other way around? Back to Matthew 6, our main text. Um, it says, again, we are not to lay our treasures for ourselves in heaven, but then we are exhorted to lay up for ourselves treasures. Sorry, we are not to lay for ourselves treasures on earth, but we are exhorted to lay our treasures up in heaven. And so what does this actually mean? Um, is it even possible for one to lay up their treasures uh, in heaven? I mean, we are not there. How can I lay up my treasures in heaven? And so in a similar fashion as, 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 as we have seen in Luke 12, one of the ways that you can understand this is look at the opposite of one command to understand what the other commandment says. So, for us to understand what he meant by not lay, by not lay treasures for ourselves on earth, then we need to understand what it means by laying up treasures for ourselves in heaven. And if we do so, then we will not lay up treasures for ourselves on earth. And one of the ways we have seen that from Luke chapter 12, verse 21, is by being rich towards God. But then I'll take us to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 to 19. Maybe we, we, we not open, I can just read through it because of time. Uh, the Bible says that uh, as for the rich in this present age, uh, this is Paul speaking to Timothy. Verse 17 of First Timothy chapter 6. Paul says, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainties of riches, but of God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. The rich are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they will take hold of that which is eternal life. So the Bible basically gives us a way by which we can store for ourselves treasures in heaven. The Bible calls us towards generosity. The Bible calls us towards a readiness to share. The Bible tells us that by doing so, we lay our treasures for ourselves in the heavens. So, that is one way that we can lay for ourselves treasures in heaven. Generosity, 
are you willing to share, you know? And a question for us this evening again would be, is this, is our, are our hearts set on these things that the Bible says? Are our hearts set on good works? Are we set on uh, generosity? Are we set on uh, being ready to share what the Lord has given to us? So we have seen that this is one way through which we can lay our treasures in heaven. Another way, and maybe a very specific way or example, by which we can lay up uh, treasures for ourselves in heaven, appears in Luke chapter 16. And I love it, I love it in verse 8 and 9, but maybe I can just explain the context of, 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 what, that, of what that portion of scripture says. This is the parable of the dishonest money, dishonest manager, I believe. And what you have in Luke 16 is um, a manager who was entrusted, uh, entrusted things entrusted a household, let me say so, by, uh, by an owner or a master. And so it came to the attention of the master that the manager was waste, wasting away what, what he was supposed to pay through his steward. And basically what the, the, man, the master did, he fired the manager. He told him, you know, I'll, I'll let you go. And uh, what now the manager did, he he, he called the debtors of the master and he told them, look, whatever you owe the master, I'm going to remove a specific percent so that you owe the master less. Basically, he gave them discounts. And when he was doing this, he was, the Bible says he was doing this so that he can secure for himself a future. The actual words say so that when he was removed from management, people would receive him into, his, into their houses. So that was his intention of calling the debtors of the master and then, you know, giving them discount so that, you know, he might have, uh, he might have a place, uh, a place for himself after his discharge from his duties. And verse 8, the rebel says that, uh, in verse 8 of, of, of Luke 16, the rebel says, the master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. But then Christ follows up by saying, for the sons of this world, a very famous verse, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of a righteous wealth, so that when it fails, they will receive you into the, the eternal dwelling, into the eternal dwellings. So Christ tells his disciples, Look, you think what the manager did was shrewd? Let me show you what is more shrewd. Or put differently, let me show you a way that is more shrewd than the sons of this world and the or a way that is more shrewd than the manager's shrewdness. Then Christ proceeds to say, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wells, unrighteous wells, so that when it fails, they may receive you into eternal dwellings. And in short, Christ tells them to invest in heaven, and by doing this, they lay up treasures for themselves. So Christ commands, Christ uh, exhorts us to lay for ourselves treasures in heaven by investing in heaven. And one would ask, how can one do this? The, the, the verse tells us very clearly how we can do this. Purchasing friends for ourselves. Purchasing friends for ourselves so that when we die, they will receive us in eternal dwellings, in, in, into, etern, into eternity, basically. And so, friends, this is an exhortation to us that we are called to purchase friends for ourselves of this act. We are called to advance God's kingdom through our material wealth and possession. And by doing so, the Bible tells us that we shall be laying for ourselves treasures in heaven. And so, do we support, do we purchase friends for ourselves on this earth who will receive us in heaven? Do we support the advancement of God's work and the advancement of God's uh, purposes in this world through his work of saving people? So let us focus on these things that the Bible tells us, which refer to the laying up of treasures for ourselves in heaven. And the Bible gives us a good motivation, even as I conclude. The Bible gives us a profound motivation of uh, why we should hold our, our treasures in heaven. Um, that verse tells us that in heaven nothing can destroy, uh, nothing can destroy, nothing can take away what we have as treasures in heaven is secured by the hand of God. If you read First Peter, it speaks of our inheritance as being imperishable and defiled and unfading. And the Bible has numerous uh, encouragements, numerous reward encouragements for us. Matthew 6, 3 to 4, 
Luke 6, 38, the Bible calls us to, the Bible encourages us that the Lord will richly reward us if we are to share what we have, if we are to advance his kingdom through the wealth that he gives us. A reward awaits us in heaven. So we have seen that that portion of scripture, God is calling us towards, you know, sharing towards generosity, towards storing for towards uh, advancing God's, God's, God's work in this world, the work of the gospel. So verse 22 to 23 is usually an unusual verse. I mean, if you read it, it looks like it was just dropped from, <laughs> um, it was just picked and dropped here. I think it's hard to really connect what it means. But I won't explain it in details because of time. But uh, basically the Bible says the eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. And that word healthy is the word that is translated be generous. That's why it's there, that's why it's in the context of money. And basically what God is saying is if our hearts are generous, our whole body will be full of light. And that's how serious this command is. It's really a matter of our spiritual perception. If we are stingy, because that's how it's usually used in Greek, when they say one has a bad eye, normally they refer to a stingy heart, a begrudging heart. So if we are stingy, then we, we lack spiritual perception. And therefore God calls us again to generosity. And I believe that's what this verse calls us to. Those commandments speak about generosity. They speak about being rich towards God as we have seen. They speak about being ready to share we are one against having a bad eye, having a stingy eye or a stingy heart. And therefore the Bible promises us that if we are generous, then our whole body will be full of light. Then our eyes will be opened and gain more spiritual perception or perspectives. And then the Bible says in verse 34 that we cannot serve two masters, for either we will hate the one and love the other. And the Bible is, is very black and white of this thing. There, there, there are no two ways. There is no sitting on the fence. It's either you love God or you love money. You can't love God. You can't be, you know, the people say it's a right balance. It's really not a right balance. You either serve God or you serve money. And there's so many warnings, especially in the Bible, about our heart and in regards to wealth. If you just read First Timothy chapter 6, the Bible warns us against you know, the desire of being rich, the Bible wants us again is the love of money. Yeah, and actually, it's so serious because the Bible says, through that one desire, you open up yourself to numerous other desires that lead you to destruction. Basically, by one desire, you open up yourself to, I mean, another desires um, that will lead you to destruction. So it's, it's, it's serious, um, and, and, and the Lord calls us I mean, it's a choice. The Lord calls us to make a choice. Do we want to serve money? Do we want to serve God? Will we be devoted to money? Or will we be devoted to God? We, the Bible says that if we, if we devote ourselves to one, then we'll automatically hate, uh, we'll automatically hate the other. So we can't, we, can't serve, we can't serve both of those two. We can only serve either God or money. So how then do we manage our finances? Um, it's really by having our hearts in the right place. It's really by having our hearts postured towards God. It's really by doing what the Bible calls us to do, which is to be ready to do good, to be ready to support God's work, to be generous in what the Lord has given us. This, that's how we get to store up ourselves treasures of in heaven and not on earth. So this was a challenge to me as well. I mean, when I read this, um, it's a big challenge to my, to my heart. It's a big challenge to my life and how I view money. Um, I mean, the Bible says if I just have the wrong view of money, if my heart is stingy, then I lose spiritual perspective. I, my perception of what truly matters gets blinded because of uh, being stingy. And Colossians, which is what I will end with. Um, Colossians chapter 3. I think we can just stand there. Colossians 3. The first 
three verses. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So the Lord calls us to set our hearts above, to set our hearts on the things of God, not on the things of this world. And so the question is, shall we store our treasures in heaven? Shall we? We will be ready to do what the Lord has called us to do. Let's pray. Um, Lord, we are thankful for your word. We are thankful for where you have helped us, that you have taught us through your word, you have helped us to see. What really is the right view of money and wealth and possessions? We are thankful because you are the one who gives us these things, these very things. And we are also thankful because you have given us uh, these commandments in Matthew chapter 6 the command to store our self treasures in heaven and not on earth. Because in heaven, our treasures will be secure in your hands in heaven. Our Treasure can never perish, can never be taken away by this. Most moths and rust cannot eat them away. It's a cure. We are thankful because you have also availed evidence for us on how we can lay up our such treasures of heaven. In heaven, we only pray for much grace and much strength that you will help us to be generous, to be ready to, to share what you have know, given us. It's not easy, O oh Lord. Um, our hearts easily get as uh, snared or swayed by the things of this world, by the wealth of this world, and we forget the commands that you've given us, which are really serious. But by us setting ourselves or our hearts on a path of a love for money, we expose ourselves to many senseless and harmful desires that lead to destruction. Oh, would you save us and keep us from the love of money? Would you save us and keep us from and would you say what will keep us from this desire of, of, of being rich, O oh God? And would you grant us much grace to be rich towards you? Would you help us to see you as more valuable and treasure you above everything in this world? Or would you help us to be very deliberate, especially in the world, as we have seen in Luke 16, where you command us and you call us to purchase for ourselves friends who will welcome us in eternity when we die? We pray that Lord would you give us a heart towards your work, and not just through prayer, and not just through you know, following up what is happening at the mission field, or following up what is happening through your work in this world to advance the gospel, but it will also help us to spare our money to support your work, O oh God, because this truth is really for us that treasures it. Would you encourage us in these things, O oh God? Keep us from being stingy to our family members, keep us from being stingy to our colleagues, keep us from being stingy to each other uh, as believers and as saints. And will you help us to focus and to set our hearts on the things that are above, the things that are in heaven where Christ is. And this is privileging and trusting in this husband.